Great to be back, you guys. You know, I was looking down at my, my badge, and it had five stars on it. I said, boy, that's a lot of stars. And then I realized I'd been here for five years now. And this entire five years, I've been sort of barking about the same thing. What, what have I been telling you guys about? <laughs> anxiety, right? Floating and anxiety. And it's, it's a real uh, special treat to be able to come here and present to you as my first audience, actually, our first set of data with floating and people who suffer from clinical anxiety. And I set it up in kind of a different way. I'm going to take you guys into the depth of the research. You're going to see the data exactly as it was presented to me. And we're going to dig into it. I'm going to dig into the theory. I'm going to dig into the, the findings at the individual level, at the group level. And I want you guys to, to come away from this talk with a richer understanding of what's happening in the short term, OK? We're talking about the short-term effects of a single float in somebody who suffers from anxiety. So let's begin. Um, one note here is I call it flotation rest, which is some, uh, a term that some of you probably know very well, but I, I changed the word just a little bit and refer to it instead of restricted environmental stimulation therapy, reduced environmental stimulation therapy. And I think it's a more accurate name, in fact, for what we're doing. So for those who don't know, I, I work at Laureate Institute for Brain Research. We're located in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's a very unique place where we're, we're really given the, the grandiose goal of thinking outside the box to come up with new ways of helping people with mental illness. And I think we're, we're achieving that goal. So everyone knows what this is. Hopefully, everyone has one. <laughs> and if this is your brain or the cortical surface of your brain, then this is your brain inside of a float tank. All forms of external sensory processing are dramatically reduced. Vision, hearing, proprioception, tactile sensation. Not on here is thermal sensation, olfaction, gustation, and also cortical functions like movement and speech. They're all reduced very naturally inside the float environment. So when you first look at this, you say, well, that's a lot of cortical real estate. This is a very tremendous intervention in terms of affecting a broad swath of brain tissue. But what's left? And this is the part that's always fascinated me about floating. There's a very rich stream of sensory processing that's coming into the brain at every moment of the day, and it really blossoms inside of the float tank. It's referred to as interoception, and it's the brain's ability to sense the inside of your body. This is what comes to front and center in the moment of a float. And I think this is the mechanism by which it's helping people who suffer from anxiety. So I'm going to tell you a, a quick story. My first float, I realized this, because I normally would uh, try meditating outside of a float tank for many years, and I just do simple breath meditation, and you're just focusing your attention on the, the movement of the breath inside and out, in and out, and you might get a glimmer of, you know, like 30 seconds to a minute in a sitting meditation session where you're just zoned in on the sensation of the breath. And I'm sitting there in the float tank, and I'm realizing right away, I can not only feel the air, but I feel it actually going down my windpipe into the trachea, which I've never been able to track with that level of acuity. And I realized I could actually feel the temperature difference. It was coming in a little bit uh, cooler, and then as it heats up, it would come back out a little bit warmer. And I said, this is incredible. This whole area of sensation was just basically a, a spotlight shone right onto it, and I didn't have to do any work. And so I started thinking, what could we do to use this as a tool to help people who actually are having trouble with their heart-brain or uh, inner-body-brain connection? 
So I started thinking of floating instead of as a form of sensory deprivation, actually as a form of sensory enhancement, really for the internal body. And I wanted to actually measure this. So I'm going to show you data from 50 patients with different forms of anxiety and depression. And they're rating very simply over the past hour, how intensely did you feel your breath, your heartbeat, and your stomach and digestive system. And it's a simple scale from not at all to extremely, zero to 100. And we have them rated before their float begins. And then we have them rated at the end. Very clear effects. And the interesting thing is it's not all internal sensations that are intensifying inside the float environment. It's very specific to cardiac and respiratory sensations. And as I had felt my own first float experience, sure enough, the breath is oftentimes front and center. So I think this is a very important finding, this idea that floating could actually enhance certain sensations. And the degree to which they enhance those sensations could be very important for the clinical benefit. So let's take an aside for a moment. Given this new information, some of you may wonder, why do we still call floating sensory deprivation? And I wonder the same thing. Honestly, I think we should really reconsider as a whole field whether this is a term we want to be associated with an experience that is actually very different than deprivation. Let's talk about why I feel that way. So this is the brain again. As I mentioned, it is a form of sensory reduction. We're reducing the input to the brain. But we're not depriving it, right? Take movement, for example. If you want to move inside of a float tank, just move your arms. You could swim around. You're floating. If you want to feel tactile sensation again, just move a little bit, and all of a sudden, you could feel all the water around you, right? If you want to have visual input given back to your brain, in the pool that uh, uh, Colin created at Float Away, all you have to do is wave your arm, and an infrared wave detector will turn the lights on and off. The lights come back on. You're not deprived of any sensation, right? So keep that in mind. I don't think it's fair to call this sensory deprivation because it's not depriving the brain of anything. That's sensory deprivation. <laughs> That's actually Donald Hebb, who's a Canadian neuropsychologist, a very prominent neuropsychologist, who was paid by the CIA back in the 40s and 50s to do this line of research where you basically mummify people. And they're totally sort of trapped in that situation for hours or sometimes days. They can't move, they can't see. They can't change the dynamics of that situation, right? That's sensory deprivation. And that drives people nuts, as you could imagine. <laughs> OK? Not sensory deprivation. Totally different. Night and day. Sensory deprivation, yes. <laughs> Not sensory deprivation. <laughs> so I want you to think about this carefully, because what you don't realize is when you call something sensory deprivation, all of these stereotypes come rushing back in, right? And when I work with patients, guess what? They're anxious, and they look up everything. And the first thing they see when they look up floating is sensory deprivation. I think it, it's something that we should just be conscious about and really reconsider whether we want to be associated with that history. And you know, my own take on this is let's refer to this as a form of sensory enhancement. That's what's actually happening. But it wasn't just me. I didn't come up with this. In fact. One of the inventors of the float tank, Dr. Jay Shirley, was the first one to really write about this. There's Jay. He built the first fully immersive float tank. It was a vertical float tank in 1957 in the state I'm currently at, which is very bizarre. You don't hear much about Oklahoma in terms of being progressive on these sorts of things, but it was extremely progressive on floating. And in his first paper that he published in 1960, he just started describing what was going on. And this is exactly what he said. He got a couple doctor friends of his to try this out. 
He said, under the extreme conditions of our experiment, clear limits of what might be expected were non-existent. Two physician subjects independently reported having been startled to hear, without benefit of stethoscope, their own heart sounds at ear-filling intensity. One of them reported having heard repeatedly the sat snapping sound of his own aortic cusp closing at the end of each systole. Such reports, if verified, raise the interesting question of whether they are to be regarded as instances of enhanced sensory acuity, lowering of sensory thresholds, or enhanced ability to fix attention. There it is. So I think what we're really discovering is that we got associated, I think, oftentimes maybe unfairly with the whole notion of sensory deprivation, but in fact, from the very beginning days, this was viewed as a form of internal sensory enhancement. So let's talk a little bit about anxiety disorders for those who don't know what they are, much about what anxiety is, but I would say if you're human, you probably know what anxiety is. It comes with the experience. But anxiety disorders are a little different than just typical anxiety, right? When we talk about disorders, we're talking about things that really impair your life, your ability to function. And this is the most common of all the psychiatric conditions, about twice as common as depression, and often comorbid. And when I say comorbid, I mean depression and anxiety often go hand in hand. In fact, rarely do you have one without the other. And that's interesting twice as common in women than men, and a lifetime prevalence of about 25%, which means when you look around this room, at least a quarter of you at some point in life are going to have a full-blown anxiety disorder. It's also the sixth leading cause of worldwide disability. People with anxiety have trouble working, they have trouble functioning, they have trouble maintaining relationships. It turns out depression just got ranked by the World Health Organization as the number one cause of disability worldwide. So the combination of these two are having a tremendous impact on society. Here's where it becomes a little bit more dire. They've done a lot of big studies on all the top-notch treatments they have out there. All the SSRIs and SNRIs, the cognitive behavioral therapies, the different drugs. And the meta-analyses and really large-scale clinical trials suggest that only about half of the patients are actually getting better. And the truth is, when you have comorbid anxiety and depression, the outcome is substantially poor, and you have trouble adhering to the treatment. So there's a major gap, right? We have millions of people suffering from anxiety and depression, and we have treatments that are only working in half the people. That's not very good for a medical discipline, right? When you have to flip a coin and say, well, I think you might get better or not. We should have something more reliable, don't you think? So 40 million people currently have an anxiety disorder in the country, and it's broken up into a whole spectrum of disorders, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, post-traumatic stress or PTSD, specific phobias, panic, agoraphobia, each one kind of has a different flavor, a different set of triggers, right? But at its root, all of them share that common feature of anxious distress for whatever the myriad number of triggers might produce. And the other sort of sad part is only about a third of the patients are receiving treatment. And the real reason is the other thing that all these disorders share is this feature of avoidance. When you suffer from anxiety, you void whatever could cause that anxiety, whatever could remind you of that anxiety. And oftentimes, treatments could fall into that. And so I think this is a key thing we have to recognize as a barrier to entry, a tremendous amount of avoidance of life experience. So what do we know about floating and anxiety and depression? When I first got into this five years ago, I thought we had a lot more information. But it turns out there's only been a few studies, and I'll take you through those. The first one was actually done in 1990. It, it was a retrospective study, so they'd been collecting data at a hospital in Wisconsin. And they were doing a stress management program that involved flotation, among other things. 
and they just sort of tested a panoply of patients of different clinical conditions, and about 23 of them suffered what they called generalized anxiety, which is a condition where almost everything could create worry and anxious apprehension. And they reported that after about seven float sessions, it was uncontrolled, uh, people did report some benefit when they measured their anxiety levels about seven months later. So it was the first indication maybe something is happening. More recently, in fact, last year, the Swedish group published a very interesting study. It was a pilot trial with a control group. They had 50 participants. They were self-diagnosed with generalized anxiety, so they just took a questionnaire. And they were randomized to a weightless control group, and uh, the other half had 12 uh, float sessions. In Sweden, for whatever reason, they only do 45-minute float sessions. I can never figure that out. That's right. Maybe the heating's not quite, quite up to par for the water. But what they found was a significant reduction in symptoms of anxiety, both at the end of treatment, about a medium effect size, but a maintenance six months later. That's exciting. And much more so than the control group. So I think this was the first clear indication that we're getting some long-term benefit with rep uh, repeated practice of floating. The same Swedish group also looked at a different population, kind of a heterogeneous group of people with stress-related pain and what they called burnout depression, which is really people who have tremendous stress at work, workaholics or just a bad boss. And they reached that sort of brink. And they gave them uh, 12 float sessions, and they showed that, sure enough, you do decrease the level of stress and anxiety, and it maintains for four months post-float. So another study indicating some long-term changes. But we really don't know anything about the short-term changes yet either. None of these studies actually looked at it. And then when you scour the literature for any other studies on depression or any of those different anxiety disorders that we mentioned, it turns out there's nothing out there. So when it comes to conditions that we all think should have a very powerful effect inside the float tank, we really have no empirical data to back that up. For example, PTSD, not a single published study on it. Panic disorder, agoraphobia, social anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder. I was really shocked that there hadn't been more float research on major depression. And so I think this is a big hole that we have to start filling. And what I'm hoping to do is begin to fill that void in today. Because what we decided to do is rather than try to study any single one of these disorders, we took the whole group of them. Before I could get you there, though, to the meat of this, let's talk about a very important construct. And I, I apologize. You guys are going to get theoretical information that most graduate students don't even have to get. So bear with me here. This, I want to take you through these theories because they're important in terms of how I view floating and the mechanism by which it works. And I think anxiety sensitivity is a very important construct. It's defined as a fear of anxiety-related sensations, especially those arising from within the body, such as dyspnea, difficulty breathing, or palpitations of the heart. And individuals with high anxiety sensitivity often believe these sensations can lead to adverse consequences, including their own death. Okay? And I'll give you a case example of that shortly. So, when I talk about anxiety sensitivity, I'm really referring to all of these interoceptive signals that are coming in every moment of the day, in every moment of our life, and they could be aroused in a number of different ways. There's so many reasons why you might get perturbations of your internal body, right? And it's oftentimes totally unrelated to the events that are happening in the world around you. But this is a recipe for disaster, right? Because anxiety sensitivity could be a very fundamental fear, such that any time you feel these sensations, they could provide a motivation to avoid whatever is happening at that moment in time. And it could quickly cascade 
a conditioning process gone awry where suddenly everything is causing your anxiety. You can't discriminate anymore. Think about that. If every time you feel your heart flutter or feel a little bit of difficulty breathing and the first thing your brain does is that, what could be causing that? And it just looks to latch on to something. That something that it latches on to is something that you're now going to avoid. And so your life becomes more and more limited as you make these associations. And because of this, they refer to this as a transdiagnostic concept. Essentially what that means is high levels of anxiety sensitivity are found across the whole spectrum of anxiety disorders. It doesn't differentiate. All of them have this core feature. And as a virtue of this relationship, this has become a core construct underlying the initiation and maintenance of pathological anxiety. So, let me give you a case of anxiety sensitivity gone wrong. I'll, I'll tell you a story about a patient of mine. This was a patient who was a veteran who had pretty bad PTSD following the Iraq War, and we'll refer to him as Freddy. And I, I really enjoyed working with Freddy because he wanted to get better so desperately, yet the anxiety sensitivity kept hijacking the process. So when I met Freddie, he was in pretty dire straits. He was having panic attacks several times a week. And this goes back to this notion right here. It would always be the same thing. No matter where the panic attack started, he'd feel his heart starting to pound. It would get faster and faster. And then all of a sudden, he'd think he's having a heart attack. And it didn't matter how many times he'd had the panic attack. The thought that he was having a heart attack was reflexive. It was like a doctor hitting his knee with a little tool, and there it was. He thought he was dying of a heart attack. And inevitably, Freddie would flee to the emergency room. And they'd do the whole battery of tests, give him a full EKG, a full workup, and several hours later, the doctor would come back into the room and say, Freddie, uh, there's nothing wrong with your heart. You're fine. And he'd go, oh, thank God. I thought I was dying this time, Doc. I thought it was the real time. And then a few days later, there it came again. And this is a guy who has totally intact cognition. Think about that. He knows that he keeps having these occurrences. He knows that the doctors keep telling him, there's nothing wrong with you. But at the moment of panic, it's so profound that he knows he's dying and no one could tell him otherwise. So this is the beginning of anxiety sensitivity. It starts with that profound sort of reaction to any perturbation of the internal body. But then it cascades. So after my first week of therapy with, with Freddie, he comes back and I said, how did your week go? He goes, well, it was okay, but I had a panic attack on my way to visit my mother. I said, oh, that's too bad. Did you pull over to the side? He goes, yeah, I did. And then I, w I drove right back home. I go, oh, that's too bad. Guys, Freddie didn't visit his mom for another year. You see what I'm saying? You, you misattribute the anxiety that's sort of cascading out of control inside your body to something out here in the world. But that relationship is illusory. It's arbitrary. And Freddie, for him, thought it was real. He thought, well, maybe my mom induced that panic attack, and so maybe I just need to stop seeing her. And he, sure enough, he totally did. A few weeks after that, he had a panic attack while he was at work. That was the last time he was at his job. He quit his job after that. So you see how it could spiral, and you could see the, the vicious nature of anxiety sensitivity. So why on earth, then, do I think floating is going to help this? Think about everything I've told you about the float environment today. It enhances sensations from your heart, from your breath. The very sensations that people with anxiety sensitivity are exquisitely sensitive to. This sounds like a recipe for disaster as well. If I tell my doctor friends that I want to start with a population of people with extremely severe levels of anxiety sensitivity, and then I tell them about the floating environment, they think I'm nuts. 
Why would you mix those ingredients together when these people are so afraid of those sensations? But that is why I think it's so effective. You are teaching them a whole new relationship with those sensations. But instead of a relationship that is reflexively inducing anxiety, it's a very different association. It's one of relaxation. And that is a learning process that I think is why this is so helpful. But to understand this better, you need to understand this theory. And I apologize, this is getting into the weeds a little bit. But this is the theory that originally got me excited about floating. If I didn't know about this theory, I may not have had as much excitement, and I certainly wouldn't have thought about doing this in a therapeutic context. But Joseph Wolpe, who's a psychiatrist, he's passed away, he's from South Africa, came up with a theory of reciprocal inhibition. And if there's one way to sort of summarize this, just to you know, consolidate it in your own head, the basic notion is you physiologically cannot be anxious and relaxed at the same time. That's the basic notion. They're, they're sort of polar opposite constructs in terms of how our nervous system is designed. And so he came up with his thesis based on this notion. And I'm going to show you this a lot, but I'll read it to you here. If a response antagonistic to anxiety can be made to occur in the presence of anxiety-evoking stimuli so that it's accompanied by a complete or partial suppression of the anxiety responses, the bond between these stimuli and the anxiety responses will be weakened. This is not a new theory. He wrote this in 1958 in his book, Psychotherapy by Reciprocal Inhibition. And out of this theory, he developed behavioral interventions like progressive muscle relaxation or systematic desensitization. But he had never heard of floating. But I think you could apply this theory perfectly well to the float environment. And I think we have the first set of data putting it to the test. And I'm going to take you through it, OK? Here's the first part of the theory. If a response antagonistic to anxiety can be made to occur, well, what's the float environment doing? The first hypothesis is that just by going into the float environment, reflexively, you're shifting the nervous system into a physiologically quiescent state, one that's antagonistic to anxiety. The next part says, in the presence of anxiety-evoking stimuli. What would this be in the case of someone with really profound anxiety sensitivity like Freddy. Floating is going to enhance the cardiorespiratory sensations, the very sensations that have been associated over the course of life with the experience of anxiety. So now let's move to the third part, so that it's accompanied by a complete or partial suppression of the anxiety responses. So then you could hypothesize that through a process of reciprocal inhibition, floating will suppress the anxiety responses, leading to an acute reduction in the experience of anxiety. This is just based on his theory. So let's put it to the test. Let's start off with the first one. I think this is going to be one of the simplest ones to address because it's almost impossible not to be relaxed inside the float environment, right? It does all the work for you. But the problem is we don't have a lot of research to actually say what's happening during the float experience. The equipment didn't even exist. If I tried to do this study five years ago, the wireless sensors weren't even around. So here's how we did this. We set up a condition where you were randomized to float in either a control condition, which we referred to as Earth, and it literally is you sitting for 90 minutes watching the BBC documentary Earth. But you're grounded. You're sitting down. It's kind of a typical sort of audio-visual stimulation. It's relaxing. It's not meant to be anxiety-provoking. In fact, we had to edit out all the scenes where the animals are killing each other. <laughs> but the other condition, you're not grounded. You're in the float pool for a full 90 minutes. And we did this with the people who have anxiety disorders. And we had to set them up with physiological sensors. So this is what that looks like. 
It was not easy. Um, I could tell you, uh, since I'm in charge of the budget, we have gone through a lot of money breaking equipment. <laughs> it's almost a daily occurrence. And it's because salt and water don't get along with electrical physiological sensors, period. But we figured out how to do it, and we could do a lot. In fact, Ricardo uh, uh, mentioned this morning that we're now able to measure brain waves while people float using his very novel and innovative brain station system. On top of it, you could see over here, and you could see over here as well, a small wireless EKG that we've waterproofed as well, giving real-time heart signals. And you might be able to see this, it's a little dark, it is a, a waterproof uh, cuff covering the wireless blood pressure monitor. So we could get real-time blood pressure data as well. So when you're floating, this is what you're wearing. But it turns out when you're doing the earth condition, you're wearing the same exact thing. We made them do the whole setup again. And so the idea is, can we actually see what's happening physiologically during that float experience versus sort of a typical day-to-day uh, -day life form of stimulation, just sort of relaxing, watching a, a show on TV, basically. And on top of it, the time of day was controlled. So uh, if you floated at 3 o'clock on a Monday, you would do your earth condition 3 o'clock the following Monday. So let's take you through a little bit of the, the data from this physiologically, and let's see what floating is doing to the relaxation response. So let's start out with systolic blood pressure. And you'll see uh, two different lines here, and red is the earth condition, and blue is the pool condition. And sure enough, over the course of about 25 minutes, you're dropping your systolic blood pressure by about five or so points. And in the earth condition, it generally stays where you started, maybe goes down a little bit, like right here, but not as much as the pool. And you'll see these shadings. The shadings are a 95% confidence interval, basically saying that uh, within this sort of interval, you, you feel with about 95% certainty you've covered all the possible range of responses. So there's a lot of overlap there. Systolic is going down, but it's not really going down a whole lot compared to other things. But let's take a look at diastolic blood pressure. Very different pattern. And I should point out, you guys, this is not in a small sample. This is 30 patients with anxiety and depression. And the confidence intervals, in fact, don't overlap at all. You could feel very certain that this is a genuine difference. And what you see is pretty rapidly, right actually in the first five minutes, you're getting almost a 10-point drop. And by the time you hit the 15-minute mark, you're already going down by about 15 points. In fact, you could compute a different score from baseline, and that's what this graph shows. And it's very clear, in the earth condition, your diastolic blood pressure really isn't moving much. But in the pool condition, boy, is it dropping. And this was a very reliable effect. We saw this in almost every patient. So that's pretty neat. Diastolic blood pressure certainly is an index of the relaxation response. It's actually the level of uh, sort of uh, contraction of your entire cardiovascular system, the level of tension within it. You can think of it as a tension marker during the moments of relaxation, so in between heartbeats. That's why they call it diastole. So it's when you already had the oxygen in it, it's already been delivered to the tissue through the systole, and now you get to relax for a little bit before the next heartbeat. That's when the tension in that whole system begins to plummet. Let's take a look at another measure that I'm very excited about. Tomorrow, uh, my graduate student, Obada Alzubi, is going to discuss how the heck we were able to measure heart rate variability inside the pool. It was not trivial. That little wireless EKG spits out hundreds and hundreds of minutes of real-time EKG data, but it's not always the cleanest data like a typical EKG. And so you have to manually go through minute by minute by minute 
to make sure you're marking every single R wave of the heartbeat. And that's how you compute heart rate variability. And the notion of heart rate variability is, it's, it's complex, but the basic idea is you want variability of your heart rate. In fact, we all have something called a respiratory sinus arrhythmia. As we breathe in oxygen, the heart starts beating faster in order to make sure that oxygen gets delivered to the cells in the body. And as you exhale, you no longer have oxygen coming in, the heart rate decelerates because you don't really need to be delivering it. It's a, an efficiency built into our whole cardiovascular system. And it turns out when you have depression and anxiety, your heart rate variability is extremely poor. Under these states of chronic stress, you really lose that variability factor. So keep that in mind. The other thing I want you to keep in mind is it's kind of the Wild West in the field of HRV. There's a, like, I'd say at least a dozen different me metrics of HRV, and no one could agree what any metric means. Some people say this metric is measuring sympathetic nervous system activation. Others say it's, oh, it's some ratio between these two things. It turns out there's only one thing that the field could agree upon, which is high frequency heart rate variability is a very pure metric of the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay? So here's what the pool and the earth condition looks like for high frequency heart rate variability. So once again, this is a change from baseline, and what you see pretty quickly is within the first five minutes of the float, your variability goes up, your parasympathetic drive goes up, your vagal tone goes up, and this is really the relaxation response unfolding. And in fact, what you see is it kind of keeps going for about an hour and then starts to slowly come back to baseline. Whereas the people who are in the earth condition watching the movie have the exact opposite pattern where their variability gets worse over time. And you can imagine that's probably their baseline state. That's where they live their life in this aspect of uh, uh, adaptation that really doesn't adapt to the surroundings. So this is exciting. I, I think it took us a lot of time. And tomorrow when Obata gives his talk, you'll, you'll get a sense of how hard it was to calculate this. But we're finally able to extract these data from the EKG signal. So, Let's go back to that hypothesis one, right? I think we have some real concrete physiological data to support that hypothesis. So now we know we've set up the, the core ingredients, a, a response antagonistic to anxiety. Let's go to this next hypothesis. We spoke about that earlier. Now you have to enhance the, the signals that create anxiety. And in this case, it's the heartbeat and the breath. And I showed you that data earlier. So that leaves us with one very important hypothesis to test. If this theory is correct, that means floating in this environment should help actually lead to an acute reduction in the experience of anxiety in patients with high levels of anxiety sensitivity. So let's put it to the test. We set up a study that we started, I would say, about Christmas time. Um, I remember I was floating patients uh, on Christmas Eve and even New Year's. And it was always great to see them come out of the float and then go off to the holidays. And in that case, it meant seeing family, which was very anxiety-inducing. <laughs> now, all procedures were approved through our institutional review board, Western. And we had very uh, sort of documented, clearly laid out inclusion-exclusion criteria, but it, it cast a wide net. Basically, if you had a DSM-4 diagnosis on a standardized sort of psychiatric exam of any anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, panic disorder, agoraphobia, or even a stress-related disorder like PTSD, you could be included. You had to have an OASIS score greater than or equal to eight, which is basically uh, a score saying how severe is your anxiety over the past week. And any score over eight means it was clinically severe. And then your anxiety sensitivity had to be off the charts. A score of 30 is extremely severe on this index. We allowed people who took medication because it turns out a lot of people take medication. I didn't want to exclude them. 
and they were free to take the medication during the study as long as they were stably medicated for six weeks or longer. This was an uh, adult sample, and then the other aspect is they couldn't have no experience floating before. And in Oklahoma, that wasn't very hard to find. <laughs> if I came to Portland, it may have been harder to do this study. Now, I wanted to exclude certain things to make sure we were, you know, treading cautiously. Keep in mind, you know, we were doing this research with healthy brains for about a year and a half before I ever studied somebody with a clinical issue. And we really wanted to get our feet wet, excuse the pun, on how to do this research before we would ever study a patient population. But nevertheless, we excluded relatively severe forms of mental illness. So there's no bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. We didn't have any active suicidality. And by active, I mean the person had an actual plan and they were ready to carry it out. We had a lot of people who had suicidal ideation, which is very common, but no one was uh, currently reporting active suicidality. They couldn't be receiving inpatient treatment at the time of study. We didn't want anyone with serious drug addiction, any history of neurological conditions, or skin conditions, or open wounds that could hurt uh, 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 or could cause pain during the experience. And then the last one we actually had to create because we learned the hard way, if you don't ask people if they've ever swam before, they might not tell you. And we had what I call a hanger. <laughs> we referred to her as the hanger because for about 45 minutes of her float, she was holding on to the edge for dear life because <laughs> she had never swam before, so she didn't trust the water at all. So we needed to make sure people had at least some water exposure just because we didn't want that added aspect. So this is the inclusion-exclusion criteria, and we recruited people through a very unique database that the Laureate Institute has been building called the Tulsa 1000. It's, it's a, um, a highly resource-intensive project because we're trying to recruit 1,000 people from the local Tulsa community who suffer from mood and anxiety disorders and follow them for a year. But at baseline, they do a 24-hour battery of different tests. You have different uh, uh, neuroimaging tests, different genetic tests, different neuropsych tests and computer tests. So it's a very rich database, and that's how I recruited these people. And 121 of them actually met our criteria for eligibility. But not everyone wanted to come in. And in fact, um, you'll see here we had 15 no-shows. People who said they would come in, we scheduled an appointment, we booked the room, I booked off my schedule to see them, and they never showed. A lot of anticipatory anxiety for fl the first float experience. And in this sample, I think it was even uh, uh, exacerbated further. And in fact, we had another 15 people who no-showed, but then they called us like a day later, ah, I, I think I want to come back in, could I reschedule? And then we brought them back in. So there is a barrier to entry. And out of the 121, we had 51 people who actually came in, signed their informed consent, and were in the study. And one of those we lost because, my gosh, she did not want to get her hair wet. She didn't know it involved <laughs> getting the hair wet. And it's funny, I, I'm starting to learn what a big deal this is because my own mother, who flew all the way out to visit me in Oklahoma, had a horrible amount of back pain. I know she would have benefited greatly from floating. Looks at the tank, looks at her hair and says, it's too much work. I can't do it. <laughs> my own mom said floating is too much work. That doesn't sound good. If that's too much work, we're all in trouble. <laughs> so anyways, we had a sample of 50, and I think 50 is a really decent-sized sample for anxiety disorders. Remember, these patients are highly avoidant, so getting them to try anything new is an accomplishment. And if you look at most anxiety studies, they usually have you know, a dozen, maybe two dozen patients. So this is actually a moderately-sized sample. It's not bad. In terms of the basic diagnostic breakdown, remember, it could span all the diagnoses. So we had about 26 people with generalized anxiety, 16 with social anxiety, 12 with panic disorder, 8 with agoraphobia, 16 or 17 with PTSD, including some veterans. And keep in mind, comorbidity was the rule rather than the exception. A lot of people had multiple uh, diagnoses. And another aspect that you don't see here is 46 out of the 50 
had major depressive disorder, comorbid. So this was a highly depressed sample. And what you see here is some basic demographics about the age and gender breakdown, but you would also see a little bit about the level of severity that they came in with during the float experience, the level of disability. And typically, just to give you a flavor for disability, any score greater than five is going to signify impairment. When you're getting into the range of 20, which are severely anxious subgroup, these are people who were unemployed, didn't have jobs because of their anxiety, oftentimes were divorced, oftentimes couldn't leave their house. Sometimes we had a few people who were homeless even. So you get extremely severe levels of anxiety in this anxious subgroup, but the whole group uh, uh, of 50 actually had a whole range of anxiety, some on the mild, some on the moderate, and some on the more severe. So we span the spectrum. And these are very stressed out and unhappy individuals. Just to give you a sense, this net time happiness has people rank on average how often are you happy versus unhappy. And if you look at healthy people, about 60% of the time. When you look at the severely anxious sample, they're unhappy 30% of the time more than they are happy. So it goes in the exact opposite direction. So this is a, a sample of people with a lot of distress. To give you a sense of the clinical cutoff scores, anything higher than an 8 is con considered clinically severe anxiety, and anything higher than a 10 is considered clinically severe depression. And all of these patients came into our open float room. And this is a really important part of the study. I don't think we would have gotten that many patients to even do the study if we weren't texting them this very picture before we even called them on the phone to schedule an appointment. And it reduced a lot of the barriers to entry. What you have to recognize is the whole notion of claustrophobia is ubiquitous among people with anxiety. And any enclosure whatsoever, even if it's 20 feet tall, is like getting into a box for them. And so I think having the open pool design is a key aspect of getting patients with anxiety to actually engage in treatment. And you need to keep that in mind. The other thing you need to keep in mind is you've got to give the patient complete control over the experience. You don't dictate anything. If they want to get out after five minutes, no problem. The shower is right behind you. If you want to have the lights on or off, just wave your arm. It's up to you if you want to have them on or off. And so the notion here is when the patient sees this sort of large circular pool and realizes they could just get in and out whenever they want and realizes they could have the lights on or off whenever they want, all of those stereotypes that are going through their mind just get erased immediately. And now it's not so hard. Now floating becomes a lot easier. And I think this is a key part to keep in mind if you're going to be floating people with any forms of anxiety. Now, the experience itself was extremely well calibrated. Uh, we have about 2,000 pounds of salt in here. Um, the entire room is soundproof and lightproof. We actually have 48 butyl rubber springs underneath the pool to absorb any vibrations that are coming through the ground. And the temperature is calibrated to skin temperature. So the water is about 95 degrees, and the air runs about 93.5 with our current humidity level. And one of the nice things that, that Colin built is the ability to know precisely when the lights are on versus off and precisely how long people are floating for. So I'm going to show you a graph now of everybody's behavior during a one-hour float session. So in blue is the total time in the pool out of 60 minutes. And essentially, all we told them is you could float up to 60 minutes. We didn't say how long you had to stay in. And only two people got out early. This woman got out after 22 minutes. And she really didn't want to get out, but she had some cuts on her back that she was not aware of beforehand, and they were stinging. And one other person got out, I think, after 48 minutes. But 48 out of the 50 people stayed in the whole hour. I was surprised by that, to be honest. The other interesting aspect is it breaks down almost in half for who decided to turn the lights on or keep the lights on versus who decided to turn the lights off. And you could see this group on average, about 20, what is that, 26 people, 
kind of floated most of the session with the light off, about an average of 53 minutes with the light off, whereas this group, on average, really didn't shut the lights off much at all, maybe I think two minutes on average. So you have this interesting comparison, I'll show you a little bit of data, where we could compare the people who have uh, the lights on versus off to see if that has any effect on the anxiety response. So, so far so good. We've got a good chunk of people with pretty severe anxiety to last a whole hour inside the pool. Let's see what they thought about that time. Afterwards, when they got out, we asked them, and about half of them said they wish they could have stayed in longer than the hour. 30% thought it was the perfect amount of time, and a little less than a quarter said they were pretty much ready to get out a little before the hour had elapsed. So I think this gives us a sense, a little bit, of preference, right? And in general, the preference is to either stay, you know, keep it at the hour or go even longer. And we definitely had some people who were kind of pissed that we turned the music on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about those people in a second. The next thing I wanted to do is I wanted to fully characterize the safety of the intervention. You know, we're dealing with people who have very severe issues. People like Freddie, right? I don't want to induce panic attacks. Or if you have people with PTSD, I don't want to cause potential flashbacks while you're inside of a float environment. But these are things that could happen because you're working with people with very fragile brains, right? People who've been through a lot, who've suffered a lot. And so you always want to ask yourself, are you causing harm? And if you don't ask the question, you're never going to know. And so we decided to ask the question. In fact, we had 43 questions. And after the float, they had to answer whether they had an increase in any of these different effects during or shortly after the float. And two-thirds of the effects were negative items. For example, a desire or wanting to hurt or kill yourself. Or even sort of more subtle items like diarrhea or heart palpitations. We didn't want to bias them, though, and just give negative items. So about a third of the items were very positive effects, maybe uh, peak life experiences where you say things like a feeling of total serenity and peacefulness or a feeling of flow with the world around you. And as a forced choice after the float, they'd have to rank where this was in terms of none, mild, moderate, or extreme. And this is the average score, if you sort of make mild a one, moderate a two, and extreme a three, for the entire group of 50 patients. This is the side effect profile of floating. And the first thing you should notice, unless you're colorblind, is there's a disproportionate number of side effects in the positive domain. In fact, the top 10 are all positive. So when people are experiencing an effect, undoubtedly, it's going to be very positive. In fact, the top three were a feeling completely refreshed, like the reset button was hit, total relaxation of body without any muscle tension, and a feeling of total serenity and peacefulness. And this was at the moderate level. We had many people who rated this as extreme. The other thing to keep in mind is the two highest negative effects were dry mouth and itchiness which isn't so bad when you look at the typical side effects of the current medications these people are taking. <laughs> if we have to have a black label before people get into a float tank, that you may have feelings of total serenity and peacefulness. <laughs> we apologize. That's a lot better than the typical warning, which is you may have an increase in suicidal thoughts if especially if you're a teenager. It's on all of the SSRIs. So keep this in mind. I think one of the things that was very um, interesting for me is I didn't know what we would get in terms of adverse events. In fact, I was there for every float. I was worried about it. These people had never been put through a float environment. There's no papers on PTSD or panic disorder. I didn't know what the reaction would be. But the reaction was positive, very positive. And we really didn't see any serious adverse events. I'll tell you about maybe one, what I would call mild to moderate uh, 
adverse experience. But that was about it. For the most part, it was overwhelmingly positive. The other thing I wanted to point out, actually, you might not have noticed this, but take a look at this one right here. A strong feeling of appreciation that you are alive. I actually went back into that data set, and the people who ranked that the highest were the ones who had the most suicidality. They weren't actively suicidal, but they were thinking about it a lot. That's pretty powerful if you could shift that. These are the subjective effects of floating. And to be honest, I don't think there's a graph that I've seen that more clearly describes the variety of responses that you get with the float intervention. Now, take a look at the x-axis. These are called POMP units. POMP stands for percentage of maximum possible on the scale. In other words, what I've done is I have have you know, 16 different measures here. They might be on different scales. I've put them onto that same set of units so you could compare. So when you see something moving up to 50 POMP units or down 50 POMP units, that means their ratings changed about half of the possible rating scale. And I think it, it's, it's kind of interesting. So, for example, one of the first things you might notice is floating is not inducing an extremely euphoric state. If it were, these things would be up here, right? It's inducing happiness and positive affect, but not nearly as much as feelings of serenity and relaxation, right? So I think it nicely characterizes that distinction. On top of it, people did feel energized afterwards. A lot of the patients would come in and you would see them sitting in the waiting room and they just look lethargic. It's like you couldn't get them to move at all. And they would come out and you would see this sort of very interesting change in the way their body was positioned and the way their facial expression was sort of emoting. And it was clearly one of energy, which was interesting to see. In terms of reductions, you see very strong reductions across the board in negative affect, pain, fatigue, sleepiness, depression, state anxiety, stress, and look what's the biggest reduction of them all, muscle tension. So people definitely experience that reduction in muscle tension, and it's starting to make me wonder how much the whole field of psychiatry has missed this aspect of anxiety. How much of us hold or harbor the stress inside of our muscles and that tension builds up and unconsciously influences our anxiety levels. And so I think this could be a key part of what is happening in the float experience. So, one thing to keep in mind, these are statistically significant. You could see the p-values here. Typically, p-values are about 0.05, meaning you have about a 5% chance for a false positive. We're going down to 0.001 or 0001 for most of them. These are highly significant effects. They're not subtle changes. And let me take you through a couple of them. This was our primary outcome measure, the Spielberger State Anxiety Inventory. This is an inventory that's been used for decades. It's been used in other clinical trials. It's been used in other relaxation type studies. And it's really measuring how much anxiety do you feel right now at the present moment. And we measure this before the float, pre, and also immediately after, post. And we also did this in a non-anxious sample. These were 30 people who had no history of anxiety, no history of any psychiatric illness. And it was also their first float session as well. So you could kind of see the differences as a reference. And clearly, you know, this is an anxious sample, they have a lot of state anxiety at the beginning. By the end of the float, their state anxiety levels have dropped basically to the levels that the non-anxious sample were at before their float began. In fact, even a little bit lower. So we're taking an anxious sample and getting them closer to what you may call a healthy level, right, of anxiety. Let's take a look at the entire sample of 50 patients on this measure. Red is their pre-float state anxiety score. Blue is their post-float. And you could see you have some people who had really high state anxiety at baseline. You had some people who had pretty low state anxiety. But across all 50 patients, 
it dropped from pre to post float. That blew me away, guys. You never see that in other types of interventions, that level of reliability. And it didn't drop, you know, as much for everyone. Look at this person, he barely dropped. But then you had some people who, you know, were way up here and then shoo, so you had this level of variability, but it was very consistent. Take a look at serenity. Same thing. The sample came in with very low levels of serenity, but by the time the float was over, their serenity was just as high as the healthy sample. And you could look at each one of those individual serenity changes in the 50 anxious patients, and it's the same exact thing. All 50 showed a pre to post float increase in serenity no matter how low they started at baseline. So I think, you know, this in some ways really categorizes what are the core features that are changing with the float experience. Well, it's reducing your level of state anxiety. It's enhancing your level of serenity. That's important. Don't forget there's a yin and a yang there. And you can't just say we're, we're reducing symptoms of mental illness we're also increasing symptoms of mental wellness. And this is a very important aspect of the float experience that a lot of other treatments don't offer. Let's compare the anxious sample to that non-anxious reference sample of 30 naive, healthy floaters. This is an important graph, I think. What do you guys notice? the pre to post changes are a lot higher in the people with anxiety, right? Think about that. Take something like state anxiety, right? They're dropping over twofold higher than the non-anxious sample. They're coming in with a lot more as well. I think what this graph should illuminate for you is that floating is having a much bigger effect on the people who are suffering than the average day-to-day -day floater. And it's all in the right direction. Another thing we could do is we could parse out the anxiety sample and say, well, maybe the people who are you know, mildly or moderately anxious were getting better, but the severe people, the ones who, who came in with you know, horrible levels of anxiety at baseline, who normally don't get better with treatment, maybe they're not doing as well with this. So you could actually separate the most severe subset of the sample from everybody else, graph it out, and that's what that looks like. In fact, you guys, what this suggests to me is the more distress, the more anxiety that you bring into the experience, the more you get out of it. In fact, it's huge. Look at that. Negative affect, which is really one of the core indicators of negative mood, goes way down in the severe subsample. It's not moving much in the less severe. Same thing with all of these measures, depression, state anxiety. You even see it in measures of relaxation. So I think this is a fascinating part of the, the float experience, is you could actually, based on what you come in with, know that you're going to have a bigger effect the more you bring into the experience. <clears throat> now, another thing we could do with the data is we could calculate effect sizes. An effect size is how you compare across studies. When you do clinical trials, you always want to know what's the effect size. The p-value just tells you whether something's significant. The effect size tells you how large of an effect it is. And typically, in a Cohen's D effect size, 0.8 is considered a large effect. So if you take a look at all of the pre to post changes in the 50 patients with anxiety and depression, what do you notice about the size of the effect? There's actually a word for this. When an effect gets to the level of a Cohen's D of 2.0, it's called huge. <laughs> but given our current context, I don't use that word anymore. So, two of the biggest variables that I showed you, state anxiety and serenity, have very large effects. The sort of effects that you know will be reproducible if you were to do this study again. And I think that's an important aspect of this graph here. 
One other thing we could do is we could parse out the effect sizes based on the different diagnostic categories, right? Did this help people with PTSD, maybe more than people with panic disorder? If you had the lights on versus off, did it make a difference on any of these effect sizes? So we could kind of do a comparison of effect sizes across all the different subgroups. And that's what this shows you. You, you see down here you have a color code of effect sizes ranging from strong reductions in light red or strong increases in, uh, in blue. But really, any form of red and any form of blue is past that 0.8 threshold. Those are considered large effects. And here, it's kind of hard to see, we have all the different subgroups. We had the people who were severely anxious, we had the lights on versus off, females or males, people who were taking medications versus not, the different anxiety disorder categories. One of the first things that jumped out to me when I looked at this graph is there's a very obvious red line. Our primary outcome measure of anxiety, the very thing that Wolpe's theory of reciprocal inhibition says should go down in this heterogeneous sample of people with anxiety sensitivity. It certainly does across every single subgroup at a very large effect size. So that's interesting. It means irrespective of what condition you have, irrespective of what causes your anxiety, if you come into float, you're going to see a drop in your state anxiety levels. That, to me, is maybe the most important finding of the whole study. But on top of it, you see, in general, large effect sizes across all of the variables for things like stress, muscle tension, depression, negative mood, even things like serenity. One interesting thing, people who had the lights on did not have as big of a drop in serenity. That was maybe one of the only differences between the lights on and lights off group. For the most part, there were much more similarities than differences across all of these categories. The one thing that was really kind of different across different groups and categories was fatigue and sleepiness. Some people would come in, they'd float, they'd feel energized, they'd feel uh, awake, and some people would kind of come out a little bit lethargic, a little bit tired. There was a lot of variability there, and that could have to do with the time of day. We're not sure. But on these other measures, I would say it was consistently large effects, irrespective of the different type of diagnosis you may have had. I wanted to get a sense of what other treatments this group of 50 patients had tried. And it turns out, as most people with anxiety, they tried a lot of things. About three quarters of the sample had tried different anti-anxiety drugs exercise and massage and breathing techniques. About half the sample had tried psychotherapy or counseling. Other people were self-medicating with alcohol, cigarettes, marijuana. Small sample of yoga compared to what it's probably like on the West Coast. So these people, I wouldn't say, were inexperienced. They tried other forms of treatment, other types of relaxation techniques. So then I wanted to know, tell me, how did the relaxation you experienced during and after today's float session compare to the other relaxation techniques you've tried in the past? And they had to answer one of three options. Either you experienced more relaxation with floating than any other technique they've tried, it was equally as good as the other techniques, or you actually experienced more relaxation with one or more of the other techniques. And so here's the data for the entire sample of 50 patients. And this is you know, not the sort of data that you're ever going to get a paper published on. I would say it's more anecdotal type data, right? But it's important anecdotal data because these are the patients who are suffering, right? They're the ones trying all these treatments desperately to get themselves better. And then they came in one day to this weird laboratory in the middle of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and suddenly they find themselves experiencing greater states of relaxation, greater drops in anxiety than anything they'd tried in the past. That's very important, you guys. Always listen to the patient because they know best. This is exciting. <laughs>
I wanted to present you some notes from the float. And it was hard to actually put this together because we did a debriefing interview after every float session and we just asked them very open-ended questions like, how was your float experience? And I was going through this morning saying, you know, what quotes could I show you from the different patient groups to illuminate the types of experiences that these patients had? And the truth is, it's impossible. There's too many. So in the first paper that we published, I'm just going to publish the entire set of debriefing interviews so you could read them. But let me give you just a couple different examples. Subject nine, it was nice. I mean, I wouldn't say it totally took my mind off all my stress, but it helped slow down my thoughts and I got to thinking about them like one at a time. Instead of just jumbling everything up and getting so stressed out about everything at once, I can't change. I was able to like sit there and think on it. And I don't know, I liked it. So that's one type of response. Subject two, it was great, it was wonderful. It was the kind of like taking Klonopin or Xanax <laughs> without the side effects. Just like feeling alert, not that fogginess, you know, feeling sluggish or just like I want to withdraw. It was just great, yeah, yeah, it, w it was like anything I've ever felt, so it was good. <laughs> and one thing you should keep in mind is I was doing the debriefing interviews for these patients. I was there the entire float session monitoring that there was nothing that went wrong. And when you meet these people before they came into the float, some of them were miserable. Like you didn't have to even have a conversation with them. You walk in the room and it's like the energy just gets taken from your body and you're just sitting there in a depressed state with them. <laughs> and then suddenly you come into that same lounge area post float I didn't recognize some of these patients. They were like different people. I'd never seen anything quite like it. And you could see they were surprised themselves. Here's another person. It was awesome. I feel so relaxed. I just loved it. It was so awesome. It really was. I've never been so relaxed. I felt a little tension, like you said in there before, but I just let it go. I just let it go. It was awesome. I'm so amazed by how my body's feeling still. It's lasting too, longer than a massage one time. I've never felt so relaxed. <laughs> This blows it away. I mean, I feel so relaxed. I mean, my mind is just like, hey, it's so relaxing. <laughs> you know, I don't know how to explain it any other way. It's my whole body and my mind. I feel so good right now. I'm not in pain. My knee knees usually some. My back usually hurts. I don't feel anything right now. I don't feel any pain or anything, nothing. I mean, I feel I've never been this relaxed. I feel so awesome. I really do. It's better than a pain pill. It's better, oh my God, I can't believe it. It's really, it's freaking me out. I mean, somebody could come in here, jump on me, and I wouldn't get mad. I wouldn't. I would not get mad. <laughs> so these are great. You know, I, I could read these all day because there's so much you could learn. One of the questions in the survey was like, how do you feel right now? And I'm kind of like, man, I'm, I'm just kind of like, I either just had an hour and a half massage, not the hour, the hour and a half. <laughs> or I had a really nice nap because I'm, I'm just not, I'm not foggy. I'm pretty neutral. I'm, I'm really relaxed, you know. I was going to write in there like butter. <laughs> but then I thought, no, I normally don't. But it was saying like, describe what it was like. And I said, I feel like butter. <laughs> That's something my mom would say, so I had to put that quote in there. But that's pretty much, you know, very comfortable. The water temperature was perfect. I mean, there was times where I couldn't tell the difference between the water and not the water, so that thing's great. Seriously, you ought to hire it out. I mean, <laughs> the break from external stimuli is necessary, and I think that's what meditation is trying to achieve. When you've got all this crap going on around you, well, stick them in a flow pool. <laughs> she could be your salesperson. Subject eight, you know what I was talking about, you know, with that little anxiety that kind of popped up, you know, I would like to somehow figure out like how I defeated that in there and twist it and somehow try to figure out how to apply it to, you know, my life outside here, you know, because like I said, normally I would get stuck in it. And sometimes when I realize that I'm, you know, in, in that anxiety where everything, you know, I don't know, I, I, I would like to figure out how to, I mean, as small as it might sound like to me, that's a big thing. Like in a way, think it's just because, you know, people don't know how to relax. 
But I did notice, and you know, I think that's just my body storing. Those are all the places that it stores that stress that maybe I don't even realize. And I definitely have a lot more energy now because I think like I don't know how everybody else is as normal people. But with me and my stress and my mind constantly going, like it just takes away my energy. Like I know what it, what it is why I'm just physically drained all the time and mentally, you know? It's because my brain and I just can't slow it down. So I kind of feel like I just slept for three days, you know? So you get this range of responses, right? And people perplex, you know, what happened there? Did I just relax? Did I really just do that? <laughs> you also could get some adverse experiences. These are people who have a lot of suffering, a lot of stress, a lot of memories. Here's one of them. The last 15 minutes I think were good, but the first half was unexpectedly anxiety-inducing. Like when I was taking a shower, it was fine, but when I first got in, the panic set in, and I had a hard time making it go away. My heart was racing. I felt a little bit tense. And then I asked, how long did you feel like that sensation of panic lasted? And she said, about 20 minutes. Then it subsided. But I had to put some effort into calming down. I tried to figure out what it was. Like, was it just the floating or the light or the size of the room? Or if it was darker? Like, I didn't turn the light off at all, the blue one. I didn't turn it off. I think one of my fears was that when I was floating, I kept splashing around and trying to control my environment because I didn't want to let go. I didn't want to slip into that feeling you get when you're in sensory deprivation. There's an association she had to that word, right? Like I meditate and I enjoy that, but I can always move my arms and wake up and do other things around my house. And I think this was a little different, but when I was finally like in the last 10, 15, 20 minutes, when I was finally enjoying the float, that felt very much like I was meditating. So this is a very interesting case. I remember her because she was so relaxed going into the pre-float. Normally these patients are very strung up. She was totally relaxed. She's like, yeah, I meditate. This is going to be fun. I've been looking forward to this. So I had none of the warning signs that she was going to have a panic attack. But she did. I think it took her by surprise. Now the thing is she didn't get out. When someone has a really full-blown panic attack, the first thing they're going to do is get out of the tank, and they might just flee your center. So she had enough sort of resources, enough regulatory power to quell the panic attack. But yet, it was still there. That experience is still there. So keep that in mind, you guys. It's, you know, floating is safe. I, I think we, at least with this first session, have seen clear data that we're not getting a lot of adverse experiences. But it's not perfectly safe. There could be a lot of anticipatory anxiety. There could be people who come into that first session and have a panic attack. So your job as a float center operator is to notice that, to train them, to coach them, and make them aware of that fact. But it's a very small minority. That's one out of 50 people. Here's another person, a little less severe. It was good. I had a lot of anxious thoughts and worries constantly. And I had to constantly remind myself to calm down and relax. It was difficult at first, but then I kind of just relaxed. And then I felt like I lost track of time. And I was like, well, how long have I been in here? So not the greatest experience. They had a lot of mind chatter, a lot of rumination. I think that's very common in this population in general at baseline. And some of them still had that mind chatter while they were floating. So here's the last one. This one really took me by surprise, because I've for many years done psychotherapy. And I want you to read that in the context of a patient who would say, come in every week sitting in the couch in front of you, okay? This is her response. I asked, what did you learn about yourself during this experience? And she responded, that a part of me is still in there, that I always feel so disconnected by my circumstances because they're so abnormal. And there's always this sense of dread that it's like, this is it. You know, those thoughts of death we were talking about earlier, right? And then every now and then you have the opportunity to experience a part of yourself. And it's reassuring to know that it's still there. It's not destroyed by brain damage or anxiety or just living with PTSD. That was a really good opportunity to alleviate so many different things and just get a nice quick opportunity to get closer to yourself to know that you're still there. I could sit with patients for six months every day and I can't get them to tell me that. 
I threw her in a float tank for an hour, and she was reconnecting with the side of herself that she, she thought had passed away, actually. She'd been suffering for that long. So there's something very profound there. This isn't just a relaxation experience. When you read the debriefing interviews, you realize these aren't people saying, yeah, I felt relaxed. They were actually accessing parts of themselves that they didn't even know existed. It's a very important part, I think, of what I learned from this experience, that the effects of floating in these very severe clinical populations are bordering on the profound, and it only took one float for them to access that. That's very powerful clinically. So let's go back to the theory. Let's go back to Joseph Wolpe and reciprocal inhibition. If a response antagonistic to anxiety can be made to occur in the presence of anxiety-evoking stimuli so that it's accompanied by a complete or partial suppression of the anxiety responses, the bond between these stimuli and the anxiety responses will be weakened. I think we have data to support this. If a response antagonistic to anxiety can be made to occur, what did we learn? We learned that the single biggest self-reported change in terms of reduction was muscle tension. We learned that we lowered blood pressure, especially diastolic blood pressure. We learned that we improved heart rate variability on the high frequency domain. And on top of that, we decreased their exposure to all of the external triggers of anxiety that their brains had been sensitized to over the years. That's a very important part of this experience. You have to realize when you have high anxiety sensitivity, everything makes you nervous, everything makes you anxious. For the first time, they didn't have all of that visual and auditory information pouring into the brain, and their brain got to just relax. Okay, next hypothesis. In the presence of an anxiety-evoking stimuli, we took the very people who are exquisitely sensitive to any perturbation, any feeling of cardiorespiratory sensations, and put them in an environment that brings these out naturally to the forefront of your consciousness. Okay. Then hypothesis three, so that it's accompanied by a complete or partial suppression of the anxiety response. And so the theory goes that you will suppress the anxiety response and have an acute reduction in anxiety. And that was the single biggest effect. If you remember that effect size graph, state anxiety dropped across every condition, every subgroup, so for the first time, I think we have data to support that floating creates a short-term reduction in anxiety, and it does it through a process of reciprocal inhibition. But we left out something. We left out the very last phrase here, and this could be the most important phrase. The bond between these stimuli and the anxiety responses will be weakened. What does that mean? That means this was just one float session. Over time and with repeated exposure to floating, if this theory is true, if our data is supportive of it, that means you should have long-term reductions not just in the experience of anxiety, but in the anxiety sensitivity itself. Think about that. That's really powerful. That means the next time these people are out experiencing the world and their heart starts fluttering, the next time Freddie's on his way to drive to his mom's house and he starts having a panic attack, suddenly the feeling of his heartbeat isn't so aversive. He might have this remembered association that it was linked to one of relaxation instead of anxiety. So you weaken that bond, and you form a whole new competing association, one that links the experience of all of these cardiorespiratory sensations with relaxation. And that's really important, because that means the work that occurs inside the float tank has the opportunity to transcend the environment. 
And if that happens, then this becomes a therapy. It's not just a short-term treatment, but actually something that you could bring forward to the world and actually encounter things in life that maybe you've been avoiding because of your anxiety. So this is really where we want to go next. We want to test this hypothesis. This data only showed us the first three hypotheses. But this one is really the long-term one. So where do we go from here? I think there's a couple points to, to really think about here. One is we found a very strong short-term reduction in anxiety from pre to post float in this group of people with severe anxiety and depression, okay? We also found an increase in their mood. Remember, they're also very depressed. And serenity levels went up, happiness levels went up, relaxation levels went up. It was a, a real enhancement in their mood. But one thing this does not indicate is whether this is going to help them in the long run. This was a short-term reduction. We have no idea how long these changes last for. By no means is this a float tank cure, and I hope none of you would ever use this data to support that. We have a ways to go if we're going to get to the stage where this becomes a viable treatment. And I think that's really the next step. That hypothesis four, right, where you look at long-term reductions in anxiety and anxiety sensitivity requires you to do what's called an RCT, a randomized controlled trial. That means you have to have a very good control group, more or less a placebo condition or an active control group, like another type of treatment. You have to randomize people to go into one or the other. And you have to follow them up longitudinally, many months later. So I applied for a grant this year. It's going to be reviewed at the end of the year. And it's the first NIH float grant that I've submitted. And we'll see. I think you know this is going to be a real test to see whether the federal government is going to take this therapy seriously. And until I figure out whether or not I got a score, I can't tell you. So fingers crossed. December 1st, I think, is the review. So, uh, you know, think positive thoughts that day. <laughs> but if that doesn't work, you know, we're going to have to get clever here and think of other fundraising options. And if any of you have ideas, I'd love to hear about them later on because an RCT is not cheap. Some of them could cost upwards into the millions of dollars. And the idea is that you're not just floating 50 people, but you're floating hundreds of people many times, and you're following them for, you know, sometimes over a year afterwards. And so you need a lot of personnel, a lot of resources, and it's not easy to do. But to me, it's necessary, because if you're going to get Western medicine to take floating seriously, they need to see that it works here. The study I just showed you is not going to make them take this seriously as an intervention, but an RCT will. That's the same thing that any other drug maker uses for, say, an anti-anxiety drug or different types of psychotherapy as well. It's the same design, and we have to see if floating stands that test. We also need to figure out how long do these effects last? One of the projects that uh, myself, in, in collaboration with Dr. Khalsa, who's, who's about to give a talk, uh, we set up what's known as an experience sampling method, where we'll text people every couple hours after the float for several days, and we're trying to figure out how long do these benefits actually extend. We don't know. There's never been a systematic study on this in floating. And if it extends more than even a few hours, that could be impressive. But anecdotally, I'm hearing stories of patients calling my phone a week later and still feeling some remnants of the experience. So we need to document how long does this actually last. And I think we need to determine how these effects compare to other treatments, maybe gold standard treatments like benzodiazepines. Typically, when you go to your doctor and say, Doc, I'm on edge, I can't sleep, I'm all over the place, I need something, take off the edge, they'll give you a benzo, right? Well, what happens in terms of state anxiety reduction with a benzo compared to, say, floating? And where are the two of them 12 hours later or 24 hours later? We could do that study. We could actually do a head-on-head -head comparison and see where we're at. And I think we've got to keep characterizing the relaxation response. 
What we saw today was just a taste. We saw some drops in blood pressure. We saw some improvement in heart rate variability. But I think the response extends well beyond that. We're looking at things like magnesium changes, cortisol changes. We're even looking at blood markers of inflammation and whether those change. We have all of these different physiological variables, and you heard this morning from Ricardo about some of the exciting EEG data we're collecting. And we also have many fMRI and EEG projects. Last year, I actually presented one of our first fMRI studies, and tomorrow, Obata is going to give you an update. We're, we're digging into that data deeply. We're trying to figure out what's happening in the brain from pre to post float. And Finally, we have several papers that have been submitted or are in the process of being submitted. In fact, all the results I just told you today are being reviewed as we speak. And I purposefully submitted them to an open access journal because I think it's going to be the easiest way to disseminate this. And in fact, if any of you ever want a copy of the study when it comes out, just go ahead and sign up on our email list. This is the website. And we'll email you a copy of the study. And in that study, we'll have all the debriefing interviews, all the different graphs you just saw. And it will really try to highlight what we think are the short-term effects of floating in this clinical sample. So I want to thank you guys. It's been a long hour here. And I know you just had lunch. Um, but I, I'm really excited to present these results to you. This is, for me, an eye-opening experience because five years ago it was just a dream, right? So here we are, five years later, and we have some real data, and this is exciting. So I want to thank my collaborators. None of this would be possible without them. You guys saw Ricardo and Jim this morning, but on top of it, we have my colleagues at LIBOR, Martin Paulus, the scientific director, Dr. Saib Khalsa, who's about to present the first float eating disorder results in another hour. Very exciting. Kyle Simmons, who was here a few years ago. And then also Dr. Henry Ye, who was our biostatistician that helped with all of the analyses. And none of this would be possible without the float lab themselves. These are the people behind the scenes doing the work. And, and honestly, they, they deserve just as much as I do. So stay tuned. This is just the beginning, but it's a very promising beginning. Thank you, guys.